Shalom from here in the Holy Land. Welcome to Conversations with Yael podcast. I'm your host, Yael Eckstein, President and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Each month, I will invite leading thought leaders, pastors, rabbis, and other influential guests to discuss the importance of Israel in the world today. For those familiar with my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, which explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, this podcast takes that understanding and translates it into ongoing support for Israel among Christians and the critical need to nurture that support with the next generation of Christians. Join me now as we begin this important dialogue. Forty years ago, when my father, Rabbi Yechiel Eckstein of Blessed Memory, began knocking on the doors of evangelical Christians to build support for his fledgling organization, then known as the Holy Land Fellowship of Christians and Jews, and now, of course, as the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, no one was more important or influential in helping him fulfill his vision than Pat Robertson. At that time, Pat Robertson was already a well-established leading figure in evangelical circles as the founder and president of the Christian Broadcast Network and host of its flagship program, The 700 Club. Pat's endorsement and support meant the world to my father and helped him to bring his vision for the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews to countless Christians. Fast forward to 2019, as I was wondering how I was going to fill the enormous shoes left behind after my father's unexpected and untimely death, my dear friend Gordon Robertson was one of the first to offer me his support and to host me on his program as the fellowship's president and CEO. Both Gordon and his incredible father have been longtime faithful friends of my father, myself, the fellowship, and of course, Israel. We could not do the work that we do and reach the Christian audience that we do without the help of leaders like Pat and Gordon. So as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the fellowship this year, I can think of no better guest to help us mark that milestone than the incredible Gordon Robertson. So welcome, my friend. Welcome, Gordon. I'm so happy to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be with you. And, and happy anniversary to the fellowship. It's a wonderful milestone, uh, 40 years. And look how far you've come from very small beginnings. It's such a wonderful God story. He always likes planting seeds and then watching them grow into big trees. And it's great to see you. Amen. God is great. It's something that I don't think anybody could have foreseen. And I know when people would talk to my father and say, wow, you foresaw this huge need for the organization in the field and how millions of Christians would come together to love and pray and support Israel. He said, I just did what I was called to do in that moment, along with so many others that made this huge, enormous tree grow. So I want to start off, Gordon, by saying uh, internally at the fellowship, me me personally and all of our donors and listeners are praying for the health of your father. Thank you very much. He's gone through a couple of struggles recently. He had knee replacement surgery and the recovery from that uh, has been not going uh, according to plan. He's got some fluid from it. So uh, I appreciate the prayers and we all look forward to a very uh, soon recovery that he'll get back on his feet. Amen. Amen. I believe it. I feel it. And, and I know God's going to do it. Amen. So speaking about your father, let's go back. Mm. Uh, not, not so long ago, but uh, to your childhood. Can you tell us what it was like being raised in this household of one of the most influential families and uh, always being in the spotlight, always having a role internally in your family? What were the core values that would you say defined your family? Well, I could ask the same question of you. It's sort of, it's you know, true. I, get, I, I get it a lot. What, what was it like growing up the son of Pat Robertson? Uh, he certainly instilled in me a, a great love of scripture uh, and a great belief that if you have faith in God, literally anything is possible. If, if God gives you an idea, uh, he expects you to raise it. It's kind of like giving you a baby. Um, and he expects you to parent it and, and see it into it, adulthood. Uh, so all of those things are great, but I've, I've got to confess, I'm, I'm the black sheep son of Pat Robertson. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> I, I knew uh, it was prayed over me uh, when I was young, six, seven years old, uh, that at one point in time, I would be sitting in this very chair. And uh, I said, no, I, I don't want that. I don't want to go into ministry. Um, I saw the struggle it took from both my parents, uh, the sacrifices they made and literally the first 20 years of CBN's history. And, um, you know, my father was a graduate of Yale Law School. My mother was a graduate of Yale Nursing School. They could have had successful careers from the world standpoint. And uh, I just, um, I thought, well, you know, who wants to go into ministry? It just means you're going to be poor. So I, I became the black sheep son. I, I ran away from it. I, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And then uh, God got my attention in my mid-30s, and, and I came back. Uh, and, you know, I, I left the law practice in order to sit in the very chair I was told I was going to sit in. So That's incredible God, and so God's, relatable. God's got a sense of humor. That's why he made me. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Definitely. It's everything you say. I'm, yep, I could relate to that. Yep, I can relate to that. My father used to say, uh, people, people say that I had success overnight with the fellowship. Yeah, it was overnight success after 25 years of very hard work that took a big toll. Um, so when you talk about those first 20 years and how you saw it as the child of, on one hand, you understand in a deep place this um, calling and that they're doing good things and that they're fighting for a bigger purpose. But for me, there was also this place of, but why my father? Why why do why in my mm. family? Someone else should be doing those big things to save the world. I just want a normal family who's a lawyer or a doctor. I remember in school, whenever the teacher would ask, what, what does your father do for a living? And this was before anybody knew who the fellowship or Rabbi Eckstein was. It was like, oh gosh, I, I can he have an easier job? You know, <laughs> it's uh it's hard to explain, is what I would always say. Cause I, I didn't fully understand it. I just knew that it was taking a huge emotional toll on him, financial toll on him in, in every way in building this ministry it comes with a lot of uh, comes with a lot of sweat tears and and hard work but I guess what both of us prove because I also from the age of 14 left faith left anything that had to do with ministry or God or spirituality and said I'm taking my own path but um I guess when God has uh when God has his plans there's no way of escaping it well, I actually had someone tell me that uh, God didn't just uh, hook me in, in the mouth like a fish. He, he belly hooked me. Uh, so I was able to run as far as I wanted. He knew he was going to get me back. Uh, and, and boy, did I run far. So, it, you know, you look back on that, and at least I look back on it, and I kind of smile. I mean, there are points where I, I, I kind of went, and I, I, I really wish I hadn't done that. Uh, but then you go, the mercy of God, you know, that he, he crowns you with tender mercies and loving kindness, Psalm 103. He, 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 he lures you back in with his love, and it's that goodness that brings you back. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is, you know, sort of, uh, let, let me be a model for anyone who's left the faith. You can come back. He, he wants to receive you with open arms. Amen. I just saw a beautiful quote that said, heaven isn't for good people. It's for forgiven people. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. So um, after practicing law for 10 years, you said you began working at CBM with your father. I think that was around 1994. Um, was that a hard step to take or did it just feel so natural and right that um, uh, you both got into the groove right away and found the path that led you to where you're sitting right now. I know for me personally, my father, when I said I want to join the fellowship, he at first tried to push me away to see if this was really hmm. my calling. Uh, was it something that happened naturally when you decided to join the ministry in 1994? Or did it take also some hard work? and and? Well, it, it took a lot of hard work, but it... it um... It took God. It took a supernatural in, in, intervention. I, I had what theologians call a theophany. I mm -hmm. had a, a an encounter uh, that literally, you know, God showed up. He, he proved he's real. Yeah. I, I, I don't have to have blind faith. I saw. So, okay. Uh, and that was, in all places, India. 
uh, on the shores of the Godavari River in the middle of a Hindu festival, which is, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know too many people that have a conversion experience in that environment, but that's what happened to me. And from that, uh, I came back to talk to my father, and in that conversation, I, I told him, well, I, I think God wants me to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting him to say, uh, well, God wouldn't want that. You've, you've got a wife and a child to support. You've got a career as a lawyer. He wouldn't want you to leave. You know, he looked at me in the eye and said, well, well then why haven't you? Wow. Um, and that was the conversation. One, one sentence, well, then why haven't you? And he got up and walked away. Uh, so there I am. Okay, well, that's a good question. Why haven't I? If I think this, if I've had this experience, then what in the world is holding me back? Right. So instead of coming to CBN in Virginia Beach, um, I went to, of all places, Manila in the Philippines to start CBN Asia. Uh -huh. At the time, I was trying to do a missionary training uh, center. The guiding verse was uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so that became my watchword. Uh, and it, it was it was one of those things where, where God had to work on me a lot. You, you can sort of say, okay, I'm going to turn my life around and go, go do this. And I kept going to the really hard places of Asia, the Naxalite rebellious re regions of India, the Muslim regions of Thailand and wow. Indonesia, uh, the Golden Triangle. I got cerebral malaria on the border of uh, Myanmar and, and Thailand. Uh, you know, so I was trying to be this, you know, pioneering missionary. And uh, going to places where they'd never heard uh, of the Bible. I mean, they might have heard the name Jesus, but they, they didn't understand any of the stories of the Bible. So, uh, you know, that was me. God had to direct me into, into television, and that was a series of miraculous things where a guy in a stadium called me out in the back of the room, back of the stadium, and called me up to the front and said, God wants you on television which, uh, you know, to people who don't have never had that kind of experience, it's like, what in the world are you talking about? How in the world can somebody point you out in a Manila stadium with 2,700 people and say, you're the guy to be on TV? Uh, but that's what got me in. I spent five years in Manila, and in that, CBN Asia uh, was birthed, CBN Indonesia was birthed, CBN India was birthed, CBN China, Hong Kong, and Beijing, uh, as well as CBN Thailand. Uh, and uh, those were incredibly fruitful years. Um, but then I had to give all that up, and I, I got called back to uh, headquarters. That was a struggle. Mm. Uh, the struggle to go to Asia was... It, there was a fire in my bones. I can't yeah. explain it any other way. Uh, I had an encounter. Uh, I had a series of encounters. I was divinely healed of cerebral malaria, um, drug-resistant cerebral malaria. I had a doctor look me in the eye and said, you should have died. Wow. We diagnosed you too late. And I, I got up out of a hospital bed. Uh, a deathbed and alive today uh, because of these series of miracles. But then when I got called back to Virginia Beach, it was, it was like I was giving up and I wasn't looking at it properly. I wasn't looking at, well, here's the destiny and calling that you've had since you were a child. I was looking at it uh, with sorrow. Um, you know, people who have worked long enough at CBN remember me from those time periods and said, you were always depressed. Mm. <laughs> we didn't want to talk to you because, yeah. uh, you know, you were you, you had this cloud over you. You didn't and choose it. it. Yeah, well, it was, you know, I was, I was in mourning. Uh, and um, well, even today, I mean, just this morning, I got a whole series of messages from the office in Manila. Uh, the head of uh, uh, the chief operating officer of Operation Blessing is there right now, and he wow. was talking to them, and and he was telling them that you know Gordon always talks about you guys, and and now I understand why it was his. You first still trip. have that longing. Uh, you know, you, you form these relationships, and yeah. 
you fall in love with people. And, and when you, you don't see them on a regular basis, you, you long to be reunited. So, yeah. Wow. That's it, it was, incredible. it was difficult coming back and then difficult trying to fill my father's shoes. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a nine, a nine and a half shoe size. He's a size 13. So I mean, they're big shoes to fill. And yeah, you know, I can fit his jackets, but I can't fit his shoes. Uh, well, and someone Gordon, told me, don't, don't try to do that. Just be you. Uh, don't try to be something you're not. Be you. And that'll be good. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. Uh, I can relate to every single word that you say. I could relate to every single word that you say. During my father's shiva, the period of mourning, I remember mm -hmm. a journalist came and said, you know, who was very close to my father and loved him and said, how are you going to fill his shoes? And I looked at her and I said, exactly that. I said, there's no way I could. His foot was way bigger than mine. His shoes will not <laughs> fit me. So the only thing I can do is try to wear my own. Um, and, and that's what I think the world has seen you do. And it's incredible to see kind of hear, hear firsthand in this setting that um, calling and journey that God has taken you on, because it's also so aligned to the biblical stories. You know, I think of uh, Abraham, who was raised in a house of idol worship, and, and that's, how, that's how he came to God, by seeing the idol worship. And when you tell your story, when you realized you, your, uh, your faith is calling you, and when you went back to your faith, during a ceremony that sounds like might even be have some idol worshiping in it. Yes. Uh, it's something that's so aligned and how you were called back, even though you didn't necessarily want to go. I think of when God says to Abraham, Lech lecha me'artzecha, go from your land, go from your people, go from your tongue. So this was kind of the opposite way, but it was still a journey that you wanted to take that God called you uh, back on. I have a different plan for you, God said, and, and you obeyed that and to see where you've come and how you've uh, just both in the public eye and also in these kind of more intimate settings of seeing the real Gordon Robertson um, with both your strengths and those places that are still painful, I think gives so much um, encouragement, inspiration to, to us looking in that everyone has their challenges and everyone has their calling. And you have to come to a point where you say the calling is even greater than the challenges. Well, the biblical figure I identify is Jonah. Uh, he, he was called and he said, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think he had better reasons for not wanting to do it. The Assyrians were the very ones that were persecuting the Israelites. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to have them or I want you to judge them. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to preach to them. Uh, yeah. But I, I spent time in the belly of the whale. Uh, and then I came back and, and, and you just realized the power of it. But uh, was idolatry part of that Hindu ceremony? You bet. And just one portion of it, I saw a, an elderly woman um, bow down in front of a stone cow. I, you can see this stuff in video, but when you see it in person, right there in front of you, I mean, she was three feet from me. And yeah. her earnest prayer to the stone cow yeah. broke my heart. Mm. It caused me to have some unusual reactions where... Uh, I got mad at her. Uh, how can you, made in the image of God, bow down to a stone cow? How can you possibly do that? Mm. And then I had this sense, okay, um, you know, I remember the story of Elijah. You pray to your idol. I'll pray to the living God. We'll see who gets an answer. And so I'm going through these emotions, and they're really strong in me. I hear a voice right behind my right shoulder, audible voice. No one has ever told her. Wow. And it, um, it's it still today breaks me. Yeah. You know, people living in ignorance, you know, here there's a living God all around us and, and we're constantly searching for him without knowing. Yeah. And who is there to tell them and who is there to show them the way? Wow. Wow, so powerful, Gordon. That's that's the calling of being able through CBN all across the world to be able to give this message of brotherhood, of love, of hope, of belief in God, and even just knowing what it is. Um, and I, I I think the um, 
the vision of CBN, the focus of CBN has changed over the years, going from your father to you really being in this position of leadership, of course, with the support and backing and um, I'm sure lots of advice, <laughs> but uh, behind you, you have the CBN Israel logo, for example. Right. I know that you've produced lots of different documentaries related to Israel, the hope, the rebirth of Israel, made in Israel, among others. Could you tell us how this love for Israel, which I know you were raised with, has really transformed and uh, taken root in your heart and soul in a personal way? Well, let's go back to 1969. Uh, my father had a tradition of, of taking his children on trips with him uh, where it's just one, and, and he wants to, you know, have that uh, closeness, that intimacy that comes with travel and, and his attention focused on, on, on you. And so uh, my older brother went to Colombia, my older sister went to Costa Rica. Uh, it's always been in CBN's uh, vision uh, to take the gospel outside the United States, take it internationally. So all of this is happening in the 1960s uh, in, in the struggle times. And he takes me to Israel. Um, I find that just fascinating from a whole variety of levels. Uh, but in that, I went to the Western Wall. So this is two years after the Six Day War. This is two years um, after this, you know, the Jerusalem being unified. Uh, and, you know, before 67, if you were Jewish, you were not allowed in the Jewish quarter. You were not allowed at the Western Wall. Uh, it was illegal under Jordanian law. And so here I am in 1969, two years later, and I see men dancing with Torah scrolls. The joy was unbelievable. It was finally, after thousands of years, we're back. And it, it, it impacted me emotionally, spiritually. It's a vivid memory. Yeah. So vivid that I have this bizarre Christian bar mitzvah where I take one-on-one, -on -one, what my children, my three children have all gone with me to Israel. Wow. Uh, I baptize them in the Jordan River, and then wow. I take them to the Western Wall where we pray. Uh, with my girls, we had to separate, but okay, uh, that's all right. That's a hard thing, uh, yeah. yeah we, can, we, can, we can pray outside those areas, but I want you to go and, and touch the wall. Uh, with my son, it was a, such a profound experience as we, as we were leaving that the Western Wall area and walking uh, away from it, he turns to me and says, Dad, I can't explain it, but I, I feel like I'm home. Wow. Which is uh, such a strange, I mean, for a 12-year-old boy to have that kind of insight yeah. uh, and for that to be generational yeah. um, is, is phenomenal. But then something happened to me, and this is all part of the uh, heal, healed from cerebral malaria. As I'm dying, and I have the sense I'm dying, uh, a uh, Christian hymn based on Psalm 118, uh, I don't think as I sung it uh, in, as a child, I understood what I was singing, that I was singing psalms. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. And it turned into sort of a chorus, and it's this happy chorus that usually ends. This is the day, you, you this got is it. You know the it. day <laughs> that the Lord has made. Uh, so I'm dying of malaria, and I, from the innermost depths of my being, this song comes out. Mm. And, um, I, you know, we don't have enough time to go into the whole story, but, I, you know, I, I had a foolish prayer. I prayed for a taste of Gethsemane. You know, Lord, not wow. my will, but your be, will be done. And I didn't know the implications of that. I didn't know it was going to result in a near-death experience where I was going to be bleeding. Um, you know, my, my body was shutting down. I was, um, it was, it was, it was profound. But I start singing that. And then I get healed. And in getting healed, I hear another audible voice. It's not like I hear audible voices a lot, but this is the, the second time. Get up, get to work, for I've healed you. And I'm supposed to go on a mission trip to India in two weeks. 
So I get on the mission trip and, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, we're seeing miracles. It's wonderful. Um, and I, I get really wound up uh, and, and I, I have trouble falling, falling asleep after these kinds of meetings. And I'm staying in a pastor's house in India. And it's kind of like, a, you know, 2000 year old house in Israel. It was, it was built of bricks and it had levels and a flat roof. And uh -huh. he had a study on the second level. I'm in that study and I can't go to sleep. And so he's got a library there. And I say, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'll read myself to sleep. And I literally think what, what's, what, what really boring book can I pick up? And there in front of me is a Christian view of the festivals of Israel. And so I look at that and go, that will put me to sleep. <laughs> so I pick it up and I start reading uh, their view of the Seder. And in the Seder, we get to the end and he talks about, well, this would have been the last song sung at the, uh, at the Last Supper. They sang a hymn and went out is what the Gospel of Matthew records. Everyone reading that in the first century would know exactly what hymn they sang because Next this year is the in hymn. Jerusalem. Yeah, this is well. Now this is the the end of the Great Hallel. Ah, okay. Uh, the five songs, mm -hmm. uh, five five psalms that are sung at every festival. So Psalm right. one eighteen, and I'm reading it, and it this is the day. The, the Lord has, has made, made. Wow. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Wow. Um, and, and for me, I found Jesus in Psalm 118. I shall not die, but live and declare the glory of the Lord. Uh, open up, you know, find the sacrifice to the horns of the altar. I, I, I found these verses and you talk wow. about a lightning strike. Yes. I've got to know more about Judaism. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm raised Baptist. I'm completely ignorant. I had no idea this was there. And that, just talk about lighting a fire under me. Um, you know, I, I, I thank God for Art Scroll. They've, <laughs> they've given it to us in, in, in wonderful English translation with all the rabbinical commentary and so I'm I'm doing the daily Torah. I'm doing the weekly Torah readings and the daily dose of Torah, uh, and have have tried to understand. It's it's one of those things. The more you know about Judaism, the less you know. Uh, the more you learn, I should say, the less you really know. It's it's one of those things that you have to grow up and and have that wonderful generational lineage. Uh, but um, I'm a, I'm a poor Gentile trying to to figure it all out. And you're, you're doing pretty so, good, my brother. It's so rich and, and so wonderful. So, um, you know, thank you, Art Scroll. <laughs> thank you, Art Scroll. Um, I love that because it's funny, as, as you're a Christian talking about these Jewish verses and Jewish roots and how it connects to Jesus and how it's connected you to your Christian roots, and you're talking about art, art scroll and studying the daily Torah portions and weekly Torah portions. I'm thinking about the Christian verse of um, the olive trees and how even more than the roots need the, how even more than the roots need the branches, the branches need the roots. And how through discovering these Jewish roots of Christianity, it brings so much life to these Christian verses as well, because it's something that this was supposed to be the roots of Christianity. The fact that it was lost is something that is, um, it means that so much of Christianity was lost because once you lose those Jewish roots, you're losing the branches. So it's incredible how you were able to awaken to that and, and how all the verses that you say are so uh, universal that each one of us in our own faith connects us to our soul, to our calling, to our mission, and to this love of God that might look a little bit different for each one of us, but I think really sits so beautiful beautifully together, like a, like a woven tapestry. Um, so it's understandable now how all those different stories of your life of finding God, connecting to your Christianity, connecting to this calling to spread it to the world, and then coming to uh, the, the Seder and finding within that same 
Psalm uh, verse, Hashem Nagila Bo, as you say in Hebrew. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, it it's something that tells a story, I think, of uh, where the Jewish and Christian communities were for so many thousands of years and where we've come to today in our Jewish Christian relation. So I would love to hear from you, um, Gordon, you are forefront in bridging this Jewish Christian relations now for this next generation. And now hearing your backstory, which I've, I've read about, I've heard about in little pieces, but now getting that full, um, personalized rendition of your life story. Um, it, it all makes a lot more sense. Where do you see uh, the future of Jewish Christian relations that your father invested in so heavily and uh, changed, changed the course of history? Where do you see that heading? And how can we as the next generation help it move to the right place of more brotherhood, more communication, more understanding, respecting you as a Christian, respecting me as a Jew, and recognizing that um, we're all part of the same olive tree? Well, I, I like to remind all people everywhere, Christianity is a Jewish religion. Uh, that sometimes strikes people as odd. It's It's a new thought for them. But it is a Jewish religion and a profoundly Jewish religion. The entire New Testament was written by Jews. Being raised Baptist, I remember Baptist Sunday school, we used to try to take pride in the gospel of Luke, that Luke is a Gentile name, but Luke also wrote Acts and, and, and he was an eyewitness to uh, some of the things that happened with the apostle Paul on the Temple Mount. As a Gentile, he would not have been allowed there uh, he would have forfeited his life. So mm -hmm. the entire New Testament is authored by Jews. So with that, as a firm understanding, uh, when you look back to the root, you have to acknowledge God is a covenant-keeping God. And whether that's the covenant he made with Noah or the covenant he made with Abraham or the covenant he made with Moses— uh, as a Christian, I love the new covenant, uh, but I recognize that God keeps those covenants and he will keep it for all generations. In that covenant, you find specific promises for the Jewish people and specific promises for the nation of Israel. Israel is promised. Uh, you can use the word prophesy, but I prefer promise. God backs up his promises promise to be a light to the nations. That means to me, a Gentile. Israel is proof that God keeps his covenant. He keeps his promises. And we're walking into a period of time where the people in Israel claim that verse regardless of their religious outlook, which I find fascinating, that non-religious Jews in Israel say, we're supposed to be a light to the nations. This is our calling. Mm -hmm. This is what we're supposed to do. And we're seeing it unfolding before our eyes. The number of inventions coming out of Israel, the number of problems that the world is facing, whether that's in medicine, technology, water management, farming, these things are being solved in Israel because God is keeping his covenant and pouring out creative ideas over Israel. That's wonderful. You also see in Isaiah, my house, and I love that God calls it a house, not a temple. He calls it a house. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. That's a wonderful promise yes. that he wants everybody to gather together and at, at a specific location at the Temple Mount. Today, if you're Jewish, it is so unfortunate that you're not allowed to pray there. Mm. Uh, you can pray at the Western Wall, but you can't pray on the Temple Mountain. If you do, it's going to cause some kind of riot. Wouldn't it be wonderful for that verse to be fulfilled in our lifetime, mm. where everyone gets all to pray, nations. all the nations get to pray? Here's one that uh, I think with my art scroll discoveries, I'm sort of on the leading edge, but 10 Gentiles are supposed to grab the hem of one Jewish person and say, can we walk with you because we hear 
that God is with you. That is a wonderful verse. That's one that I'm looking for the fulfillment of. I know in my life, hearing from the rabbis and looking at their commentary has really helped me in my own personal walk in saying, you know, there, there is an evil inclination. I do have the power of choice. That power of choice, will I'll, I'll never be out of that. I have free will. Today, will I choose to do the good thing? Yes. And, and what is the good thing for me to do? And how can I find the wisdom of the ages of people who have walked this journey before me to tell me what to do and how to order my life? and how to properly make decisions that are pleasing to God. These are wonderful things. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying, well, all right, I'll grab your hem. <laughs> I hear that God is with you. I hear mm -hmm. he has been with you for generations going back to Abraham. Mm -hmm. He has revealed mighty things to you. When God wants to communicate to all mankind, he uses a Jewish secretary. So mm -hmm. let's go and, and find those words. Let's find that wisdom and let's walk in that way. That is so beautiful, Gordon. All of it. My favorite Bible verse, one of them is because my house is a house of prayer for all the nations. Because I think that sums up God. So often in religion, we think it's me, it's me, it's me. And God is think you're all my children. And my house is big enough for all of you. You just have to build it and want to come. Um, and, and it's beautiful what you said about the you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you came from. So when you read the Christian Bible, the New Testament, if you don't understand what that was based on, what they were studying in the Old Testament, what you're talking about, these stories and the wisdom and the promises, then you can't fully understand the New Testament. It's like coming in in the middle of a movie. And so the fact that you've been able to uh, rediscover those roots um, is... Uh, I think a blessing, not only to you, but that you're able to give it over to all the people who so admire and learn from you. Um, so thank you so much, Gordon. I could sit with you for days, soaking up <laughs> your wisdom, soaking up your life lessons, soaking up your Bible stories. But unfortunately, we're out of time. And I, I know that you have so much to do and most importantly, to go be with your father. Um, so I want to end with a question that I ask all of my uh, guests. In these trying times, both personally and globally, is there a, we already learned that your go-to Bible uh, character that you identify with is Jonah, which I love. That's the first time I've heard that from any of my guests. You're very unique. <laughs> is there a go-to Bible verse that gives you strength? Uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Um, God's always there, even when you're rebellious. I've, I've got another verse, a quote from Psalms. I made my bed in hell, and behold, you were there. Uh, even in our in my darkest moments, even my, my most rebellious moments, God made a decision for me, and he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Sometimes people can be with you, but they've already forsaken you in their heart. They're already turning away. Uh, mm -hmm. God never turned away from me. He, he never forsook me. Uh, he was always there w wanting me to finally turn and say yes. yes. In your hardest times, I am there with you. It's so beautiful. So it's only us who sometimes feels far from God because God is always close. Amen so important for all of us to remember. It has been such an honor to have you on this podcast, Gordon. I hope that you will come back again soon and that your father will. will be able to join us as well. Maybe this year in Jerusalem. Amen. Would you mind ending with a prayer? Lord, I just ask that your presence would be manifest, that in you we live and move and have our being, and we just, we together, we join together, that your presence would manifest. And you would show people, you would manifest yourself to them. Be with everyone listening right now. And I ask that you would cause your face to shine upon them and give them your peace, your shalom. Yes. We ask it all in your great name. Amen and amen. Amen. Gordon, you are amazing. Thank you so much. And this year in Jerusalem. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Conversations with Yael podcast. If you like what you have heard, please check out my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, that explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith with inspirational and ancient teachings. You can also visit me at mybiblicalroots.org for more of my teachings, videos, blogs, and books. Follow me on Instagram at Yael underscore Eckstein or on Facebook at Yael Eckstein. Shalom and see you next month.